thank you very much for this invitation. Um, it's great to see a number of friends and to make new friends in the Netherlands. Uh, I've, I've spent so many years, uh, I've made so many trips to the Netherlands since my first one in 1974. Um, and every time I'm astonished with the continued vitality of the open building scene, uh, although there was a period of kind of quiet. But anyway, wh what I wanna do to start with is make it clear that my talk is about the prospects for an infill industry for the residential sector. And I wanna try to give an international perspective. Um, I'm, I'm now vice president of the Council on Open Building. It's a nonprofit in the US made up of a, a bunch of professionals in the healthcare sector, education, housing, urban design. And we're, we're doing a bunch of roundtables this year exploring how open building principles can support the work that they're doing in those various sectors. Um, so anyway, um, my point of view should be clear up front. We're presently trapped in a culture and an obsolete paradigm that runs deep and long in the real estate design and construction sectors. Believe me, it's a worldwide problem. This paradigm is producing a building stock that's more expensive every year. It can't contribute to the urgent need to make to move toward a more circular economy. And it's unable to adjust well to changing demands and what people really want. This existing professional building culture of which, we, of which we are a part, won't change its habits because they are profitable. Changing habits may cause uncertainty and risk. Who can blame them? Also by its nature, the building industry is incapable of investing in long-term developments, unlike other industries. This makes the industry we are part of a servant of economic downturns and upswings. The industry hires new people when business is hot and lays people off when things slow down. That said, the building stock continues to renew itself. In most countries today, more money is invested in remodeling, upgrading, and otherwise reactivating the existing building stock that is spent in new construction. A lot of this work is invisible, done without official permission and often without architects. So it's very humbling to realize that a great deal of the built environment transformation comes about without our engagement and would continue even if the species called architects would disappear. Anyway, my talk is about why an infill industry based on an industrial model is needed. Not to make uniform dwellings, but exactly to make variety efficient. Discussing an infill industry with you is very important because you, our younger generation, have an opportunity to do much better than the past generations at cultivating a truly regenerative built environment. So just a little bit about me, because you don't know who, the, who I am. Um, I was a small scale builder before I became an architect. I built small additions. I went to Puerto Rico to build houses. Uh, and then I became an architect and I designed houses and schools and hospitals. And only after that did I start an academic and research career. And even later, I earned a PhD with John Habrock at an MIT. Having taught architecture students for 35 years in the US, China, Taiwan, Japan, 
Indonesia, South Africa, and Italy, how to design according to open building principles. I can attest to the challenges in changing long ingrained habits, not only in our academic institutions, but in the profession and real estate and building industries at large. Open building and infill in the residential real estate industry is a disruptive paradigm. That's clear. Yet, everyone is familiar with the other levels in this diagram and investors and their architects designing office buildings and shopping centers know about the infill level or fit out, even if only intuitively. They couldn't make money operating in any other way. What you need to understand is that infill systems are a new decision level in the acquisition and delivery of residential real estate assets. What you also need to understand is that open building is not more expensive. The many hundreds, if not thousands, of open building projects on record around the world would not be built if the investors planned to lose money. I'll show one astonishing example of an infill company in China to demonstrate the point that infill systems are not more expensive either. Now, John Habracken made a typically lucid set of slides to explain why an infill industry has an essential role in a regenerative building stock. I'll run through them quickly. They're self-explanatory. I probably don't need to read the few words on each slide, so I'll go rather quickly, but they should be clear. Okay, so by now it should be clear that open building is predicated on separating design tasks. That's the basic principle of a regenerative built environment. No single actor does, can, or should do it all. As they say, the question is who should do what, when. So it's very definitely a political economic issue as well as a technical issue. The infill matches the basic social unit of society in all of its rich variety. There's no question anymore that residential real estate assets need to be renewable and at the same time to last a long time. The question is, how can we participate effectively and usefully in this process. When infill systems are used, the shell or support or base building, whatever you want to call it, is an asset by itself. Each fit out can be different or the same in a series of houses. An infill system includes all the installations or mechanical systems, finishes, cabinets, plumbing, heating, cooling equipment needed for that independent dwelling unit. The precise specification of an infill packet will depend on the project. This drawing comes from a study by a Chinese graduate student of mine a few years ago. Since then, I always tell students and professionals I help train to make a clear graphic distinction between the two separate design tasks to keep straight what is what, not only in broad strokes, but in every design detail. Here's an example also drawn from a graduate student's work. The top image is the whole house. 
the black is the shell, the red is the infill, and the green is the furniture. The next image is just the shell. It has the building structure, a hole for a stair, windows, facade, and fixed mechanical systems and vertical shafts. The infill consists, as you can see, of the stair, the walls, the kitchen and bathroom equipment and specific MEP lines to which equipment is attached. The developer can, of course, make all those decisions or the occupant can do that. For a company delivering infill, either is possible. Infill systems companies can also offer their product service solutions in elevator buildings. The building is prepared for variable infill decisions under a separate contract. Because it has capacity to accommodate a variety of layouts and unit sizes, the building owner has extensive decision flexibility and the building can be altered later every generation or so. This drawing is from a study a group of students and I did for the transformation of an empty office tower in Detroit into residential occupancies. Two examples of open building projects whose infill could be provided by infill companies if they existed. As things stand, the infill takes far too long to complete and is too expensive for reasons we should learn more about. An architectural office designs a base building with empty but serviced spaces. Notice that in some cases there are a number of of vertical MEP chases like the one in Moscow. In the Tila project in Helsinki, the bathrooms are already fixed in place, but a variety of bathroom layouts were offered. Kitchens were decided later per dwelling. In the Banner Building in Seattle, the common piping is in the party walls separating dwellings. Individual infill packets are prepared off-site per unit. Their accounting, cost estimating, and contracting are done per unit, not per floor or per building. Infill companies use an advanced logistics strategy linking a number of manufacturers or parts producers, a distribution center, containerized delivery, and the on-site work. Dedicated delivery containers may be used, but need not. The point is to reduce risk and assure schedule, price, and quality control that old methods just can't deliver. Work progresses most efficiently when infill companies use trained, multi-skilled teams. This avoids schedule management and quality control problems typical when different trades and subcontractors are brought in one after the other, fixing the problems that the prior uh, crew made and always have finger pointing to see who's responsible for errors and omissions. The infill is still construction, but construction by team. Of course, infill can be DIY. In reactivating existing elevator buildings, everything in an infill package comes up in the elevator, if it's big enough, or if parts are too large, through a window or balcony door. This is very important to figure out because we absolutely have to learn to regenerate the existing building stock. One month or less after work begins, the home is ready for living. Now, this talk is supposed to focus on an international perspective on an infill industry. Let me try to make a very, very abbreviated story. The, the whole story still needs to be written at an international perspective. Let me try to make a, a, a start by saying that some of the story can be found in the wonderful little book, Housing for the Millions, 
John Habrakan and Nassar. Unfortunately, NAI Publishers um, has, um, has discontinued its publication, so it's not available anymore. Um, there's also my earlier co-authored book, Residential Open Building, <clears throat> which is exorbitantly expensive. <clears throat> and more cases and information will be available later this year, a new edited book that I'm doing, Residential Architecture as Infrastructure. I just sent the manuscript to Rutledge to be part of their open building series. And Caroline kindly wrote the second chapter uh, uh, beautifully discussing some of the more current open building work in the Netherlands. There's also a chapter on Finland, Russia, um, Japan, China, Korea, um, the global south, and there are a, a whole section on infill, the infill industry uh, opportunities. The European start part of this story begins in the Netherlands. Some of you may already know this, but it's good to review it. In the early 70s, Nehaus began delivering its four DEE infill system. It didn't last very long, but they, they kept going for a while. Also in the mid 70s, Brunzel, a major producer of kitchens, developed a demountable kitchen, uh, partition system, which you see the, the delivery uh, container there in a, a project in Lunetten designed by Franz van der Werf, who kindly sent me the picture, both of these pictures. Um, the Brunzel in, in Bau packet was also used in a project Paul called Peshak in the UK. Also in the 70s, a company named Dura had developed an approach using a raised floor under which all horizontal piping could be installed, separated from the support, as well as a wall liner system behind which electrical and other conduits could be routed, all part of an infill system. It's interesting to know that they called it open building. The name, which was eventually adopted by the OBAM research group at TU Delft, led by Professor Van Randen. Studies of infill packages were made in the early 80s. For example, Vilma made a study of infill packages in 84. The Stichting Open Building or Foundation for Open Building was formed to advance this mission. Also in the mid 80s, Esprit and Interlevel were com companies exploring infill systems. Um, the Matura infill system was developed in the, in the late 80s. The, supporting it was a pioneering CAD system called Matura CADs that helped organize all the parts and also send details instructions to the fabrication facility where parts were prepared. Here's a picture of Matura's so-called lower system and what it looked like in a renovation in a 1960s era apartment building in Vorberg. And actually I was part of the installation crew on that, uh, invited to come over there just after I finished my PhD, put my carpenter's belt on and, and, and help to install this system. Matura's proprietary parts were later redesigned by Van Randen. Here you see the redesigned matrix tile and the new cable stud combined. The nice thing about this approach is that both products can be used alone or in combination. Now, important to notice is that the cable stud, which first had been licensed to uh, Giprock, uh, is now licensed to Wallhub and is being used in a project in Delft right now. Okay, let's jump to Japan. In Japan, there's a long history of developments toward open building. They call it SI housing or skeleton infill. This chart shows just some of what has been going on there since the 70s. In this case, by the government's Urban Development Corporation now called Urban Renaissance. 
it stops in 2000, unfortunately. More has happened during this period by other entities and companies and, and government research groups, and more has happened since. Probably the most famous Japanese open building project or SI project is Next 21, developed by the Osaka Gas Company and built in 1994. It's a perfect example of 3D urban design and separated design tasks. And here's what I mean by that. One team designed the structural frame, another designed the facade system. You can see it on the lower left picture. Another team developed the position and dimension rules in the upper left. And many different architects have designed individual independent dwellings in this context using the facade system in accordance with the dwelling unit layouts, including moving, adding, or eliminating balconies. <clears throat> All the work being done from the inside with no, no exterior scaffolding. It continues to be used in an experiment, as an experiment with new energy systems, infill systems, and other means <clears throat> to improve life in dense urban areas in the future. In 1997, the Urban Development Corporation, formerly the Jap Japan Housing Corporation, launched an R&D program called KSI, which means <clears throat> Public Skeleton and Infill, at their research center, which I visited on a number of occasions. They showcased at least six different infill systems, each representing a different approach by a variety of private companies or consortia of companies. <clears throat> These were completed in 1999 and opened to the public. Here are just two examples. <clears throat> of two of the six. One is the example of a company currently delivering infill is called Next Infill. Here's an example of a floor plan showing in red the parts, the partitions that they deliver. Here are a couple of versions of their raised floor. And you, you should also know, for those of you who don't already know, that 90% of Japanese multifamily housing <clears throat> uses some kind of a raised floor under which piping and ductwork and cabling and even storage is, is positioned. So the, the idea of a thick or raised floor is, is quite conventional in Japan. Here's, <clears throat> here's some pictures of their partition system going in. And here's the finished, <clears throat> finished apartment ready for an occupant. Now, I mentioned at the beginning that I discuss an astonishing company in China that is probably the most advanced infill company in the world. It's called <clears throat> Unity Tech or Henang Home. You can go to their website. And if you're a Chinese reader, you can, a Mandarin reader, you can read it. Um, I'm afraid they don't have an English version. Um, so on the left is a multi-story building into which in which all the dwelling spaces are left entirely empty by the general contractor, <clears throat> ready to be fitted out. On the left are bundled and barcoded metal studs prepared for one specific dwelling unit. On the right, a demonstration unit showing how walls are built. On the left, you see the warm, hydronic, warm floor, um, raised floor panels being installed on adjustable legs. The cover and finished floor are also visible. <clears throat> on the right, the gray water drainage pipe from the shower is visible through the plexiglass panel. The rear discharge water closet is to the right. It is similar to the the European, or I think Swiss, Hebrit product line, 
um, floor mounted rear discharge toilet. <clears throat> I took these photos at a demonstration showroom at the International Housing Expo in Beijing when I was in Beijing five or six years ago. The astonishing thing is <clears throat> that four installers complete an entire apartment in seven days. Here's the pictures, day one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. All parts are barcoded and delivered just in time from the factory or from other suppliers. Developers save time and money. This company delivers its services to social and market rate housing projects and into the healthcare and educational facilities markets. In the last few years, it has delivered, get this, more than 80,000 infill packets into large residential projects. By 2020, <clears throat> about 90% of their work was in new construction, about 10% in improving existing buildings. They recognize that improving the existing building stock is a bigger market, so they intend to expand in that market. The company has 102 patents and a 100% factory production rate. For large scale projects, they save 50% on time. <clears throat> on small projects, they save 70% on time. Also, they save 65% on waste and the repair rate is lower 95% compared to traditional construction. They are now in version three of their software enterprise management and logistic systems. The executive director said to me recently something very, very important. She said, <clears throat> some traditional construction companies are trying to do what we do, but it's hard for construction companies to transform <clears throat> their whole system from construction management to production. These are two different fields and it takes time to shift to a new mode. <clears throat> the market's huge. We hope that there are more companies to join us so we can make the industry better together. So what have we learned? From an international perspective, <clears throat> it's clear that a residential infill industry works when two markets are operating. Each market represents a separate design <clears throat> task. The time has come for infill industries <clears throat> to get into business. In fact, the future of a sustainable building stock lies in an infill industry. So why wait? You don't have to invent new technical solutions, but you have to advocate for a new way of making housing for the people. The current industry culture rejects the idea of an in infill industry but an infill industry will change the culture of building. This means that it is likely <clears throat> that an infill industry <clears throat> will develop outside the existing building culture. Perhaps the only role of government is to enable certification of infill companies to assure customers. An infill industry makes it possible that every household can control the layout of their dwelling and spend as little or as much as they please. The market is therefore huge. Here's advice from a building economist. Don't try to design cheaper dwelling units. Design what people love to have. This makes sense because when, there were, when they were first invented, <clears throat> telephones, cars, television sets, and many other industrial products were always believed to be too expensive for everybody to have. Now look at the situation. You have to know these things to become leaders 
in escaping the trap that the present building culture has made for us. Please remember, once tasks are separated, effective tools and methods are needed to handle things effectively to produce good results. As I mentioned before, to make variety efficient. You should be involved in the development of these tools and methods. Once an infill industry exists, you can make a new architecture. That's it. Thank you, uh, Steve. Sure. Um, and yeah, really inspiring. Uh, and uh, I think there are um, a lot of questions uh, to ask. Uh, how do we get this done, of course, uh, also? <laughs> <laughs> Especially in our Dutch environment, uh, which you know, uh, I think, uh, quite well. Um, uh, but uh, you ended up, uh, so I, I think one first <clears throat> remark uh, that's about the sustainability, of course, and I really appreciate your command that design what people love to have. I think that's one of the most sustainable uh, things that you can do because then <clears throat> if they fall in love, if they, they like it to have, they do not demolish it, uh, it's from their self. And, uh, they can make their own environment uh, like they uh, <clears throat> have to work on. What, one of the things that, that, that in our Dutch situation uh, uh, I like to, to point out is that we are doing, let's say, uh, uh, looking for planning commission uh, integral in, uh, in that sense. We use the Bauberslides. So you, uh, you don't know the Dutch Bauberslides, uh, for example, but you, you explained also <laughs> the Japanese uh, example that let's say the, you, you, you talked about certification also by the government in that sense. So the, the change of rules uh, uh, could be <coughs> necessary, especially in the Dutch market. We need 1 million home, homes the coming period, but it's mainly led by companies who now do, let's say, infill and the main structure all together and all integrated. So in that sense, we have to change what I learned from you uh, the rules and in Japan they already changed this. I don't know exactly what the situation in China is uh, nowadays because they have a huge uh, production of, uh, of, of dwelling, uh, I think. Uh, can you say something about the situation in the US uh, uh, also for this? Because also from the point of not only uh, uh, sustainability, also from the circularity hot topic those days, uh, the, the, the use and the reuse of materials and how you implement uh, this. It can be done also for our government to change rules and to say, okay, we need uh, main structures and uh, skeletons in which, uh, let's say, this infill uh, uh, production is also uh, guided uh, in your building initiative and to get planning commission uh, for this. So. Who is in charge here to get this done? Of course, the architects have to discuss this, but also politicians must be convinced. Can you say something more from your international, your broad international network perspective uh, about this situation so we can learn here in the Netherlands? From <clears throat> well, it's, <laughs> it's difficult. Uh, in Japan, I think it was 2000, Eight, the Japanese government passed a new law providing incentives for long life housing. And um, the expectation was that developers would grab the opportunity to get tax abatements for building big buildings and single family houses <clears throat> following this, a set of technical guidelines. Well, it's been very disappointing. Um, m several million single family houses have been constructed following getting these tax advantages. But the market is not willing to pay one euro more for an apartment 
that is built based on the 100 year uh, standard. So even in Japan, which had this long history of really a astonishing commitment by companies, government, uh, academic, and things are not going, the, the existing culture of the building industry is too strong to accept this kind of change. So that's been a rather big disappointment. Um, they've recently made some adjustments to the uh, incentive systems and the technical rules to try to boost <clears throat> adoption of these principles in their multifamily market. The, the part of the story is in, in, the, in the next book that I'm writing. Um, the Chinese example is also interesting. Um, a government agency in 2018 issued a similar set of guidance documents to promote long life sustainable housing, recognizing that the old way of doing things was just providing um, uh, prematurely obsolete building stock requiring massive investments to keep them attractive and, and up to energy standards and up to consumer demand. So they're, they're trying to reorient their housing production process, but of course there are huge headwinds. So when I found out about this infill company that I've discussed very, very briefly here, I was very excited. They're, I think she said there were really only two other competing companies who recognized this, that infill is a, as a product is a, a marketable commodity, a service in the Chinese market. Um, but it's, you know, and in the US, of course, we're, it's, it's the most retarded um, country as far as overcoming the, uh, the, the obsolete building culture. So I don't think you can look here for uh, much leadership. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a long road, but there are, there are good signs. Okay, thank, thanks uh, Steve for this response. And I also use the chat a little bit and I'm also interested in some uh, reactions of uh, Frans van der Werf because uh, there are two students uh, asking uh, Timo de Haas, one of our students, uh, does Hench Home provide furniture as well? So he's also interested in if those Chinese are also adding, uh, let's say, the furniture in, in the infill, uh, as you also explained. Uh, yeah, uh, the, the, the Unity Tech can provide furniture. Yeah, so they can deliver a complete composition. Uh, uh, we yep. in the Netherlands, uh, also doing this uh, already a little bit with Peter Starkis, the new makers are also integrating, let's say, staircases and also cupboards and all the, these kind of things also are chosen partly by by uh, by uh, um, the occupants. And uh, well, Thais, there, there's a there are two chapters in the the next book <clears throat> on China, one written by the government ministry who launched this long life sustainable housing program and another by a young scholar who studied the existing um, industry, uh, which is aimed at reactivating the, and what they call uh, industrialized interior decoration. There are, thousands of companies in China doing interior decoration. A unit here, a unit here, just, you know, of course the market is massive. <clears throat> so there, there are literally thousands and thousands of small, middle-sized and large companies doing infill 
And she writes about this and describes it in great detail. I've never seen a piece of research so good. Um, and in that chapter, she also describes a little bit about this company that I, I showcase here. Okay, then, then I add something uh, also asked by Jorn Deltman, uh, another uh, Dutch student uh, who's doing the entrepreneurial architecture uh, course. And he is uh, also, uh, and I think also other students are interested in this issue. How do the users or inhabitants get the dwelling they want? If this, uh, by choosing options or designing themselves, it's also related, let's say, uh, Frans van der Werf had a, a good experience in uh, the 70s already, uh, the last uh, century uh, with this. And then uh, Frans was doing it uh, himself uh, to, uh, to talk and sketch with the inhabitants. And we are, of course, interested also in the digital tools that we can use uh, to, uh, to show uh, to uh, uh, occupants uh, what the possibilities are. So. Um, how free is, let's say, the Chinese system that you showed, uh, or is this is this just an industry that delivers something, or is there some consumer influence? Uh, can you say some some more about this? Yeah, they've <clears throat> they started um, providing a service directly to developers. The developers didn't want to spend time, money, management costs, and risk. Uh, issues in providing the infill. So they <clears throat> they separated the contracts to this company. But now that this company has started to get traction, they're beginning to open up showrooms on the street <clears throat> where people can come in, use digital tools, cost estimating, Etc., and figure out what they want in their apartment, and then this company will deliver it. So it's beginning. Um, it's a business idea. It's not a technical thing, first of all. <clears throat> it's a business model. Um, and I think they're beginning to, to get into that market. Okay. Thank, thanks. Uh, so, um, yeah, of course, it's a business model. I, th I think you were yesterday also on the, I think, uh, also a really inspiring lecture given by Mark Koehler. Uh, you, you know him. You visit also uh, our project in the Houthavens in Amsterdam and uh, know a lot about uh, his expectations uh, and also future plans and ambitions, uh, you could say. Also, the influences, let's say, of uh, users uh, uh, or people that uh, are living in those uh, environments. <clears throat> I, I think, and, and, and yesterday we had a talk already with him also about future expectation. And this is more uh, because you were, you were you did a lot of research. You were also an architect and uh, you met uh, uh, Habrak, uh, all the people also of the history of uh, open building. And that's, this is our discussion in those days uh, here in the Netherlands uh, partly. Who's in charge? in that sense. And so you talk about building industry and you talk also from the perspective uh, of, the, uh, of the architect. So the architect is adding quality, of course, as a, as a master builder or some, somebody who's in the lead. Uh, we had Stichting Architecten Research, the foundation of architects research. So that's led by architects. But I think the balancing act, talking also about, let's say the government rules, is how do you get the situation in balance between who is, let's say, in the lead or who is, let's say, the master builder in that sense? And when you talk, when you see uh, Mark Keuler or Nana de Rue of uh, a powerhouse company, these kind of people, they also want to be the contractor. Uh, Tom France is, uh, let's say, an open building specialist, a uh, well known, he's winning prizes. Uh, he will be in the discussion uh, Thursday afternoon. Uh, also, but he takes the responsibility also as a master builder. Do you have any idea with the experience that you have, what you expect from the coming period, who is in charge here? Is this still the architect or are there new collaborations uh, together with, let's say, the whole industry? Well, I don't, I, I, it's hard to generalize from an international perspective, <clears throat> but my I think the dream is that independent companies will emerge 
to provide this service to clients, either developers or individual homeowners or housing as co-ops or whatever, and that architects will design wonderful, energy efficient, site sensitive base buildings and not have to worry about the infill, not try to control the infill. So one of the things that I was alert to in the talks that uh, uh, Mark gave and um, the other guy from May Architects <clears throat> was the extent to which they still see their responsibility as managing the infill. And I this that's okay, but it's it's not where we should be going. We should be going toward a place where, <clears throat> just like in office buildings, an architect can spend his or her time making wonderful, energy efficient, site sensitive buildings, and other companies can take care of what goes inside. They, the two different, two different markets, two different uh, financing regimes, two different regulatory setups, two different production methods. Um, we we should quit trying to do lumpy, top-down controlled projects, and open things up, recognizing the idea of separated design, and and different markets. Okay, yeah, and, and coming then to, to the next point, uh, Melanie uh, Behrens, uh, one of our other students, uh, uh, she's asking, and I think that's really an interesting question uh, too. Uh, maybe Melanie, you can ask it yourself or... Uh, or uh, <clears throat> so that's, that's the after party when the infill is there. So uh, um, is the same company also uh, demolishing or di di disassembling uh, the, the the infill uh, themselves. So uh, here in the Netherlands, we are using let's say uh, all kinds of uh, lease constructions for uh, facade uh, industry already. So you deliver a facade for a period of ten or twenty or thirty years. So you also get a, a income uh, uh, for the, uh, this uh, the deliverance in that sense. And I can imagine that this can be the same for also this <coughs> industry. Those companies are doing the maintenance and so on and so forth. Uh, Melanie, do you like to add something? Is this uh, clear about your question? Uh, I think you're still in the chat, aren't you? <laughs> are you yes, sorry? that's uh, yeah, that's exactly the question. Yeah, <laughs> what I meant. Yeah, you're fine. You're here. Welcome, Melanie. Thank you. So you're you're asking about the removal of infill when the time comes to clean it out. Yeah. Yeah, or when it should be uh, should be changed for well, different users, uh, or sure, <clears throat> there, there's no one answer. Um, I'm sure it's the same in here as it is in South Africa and the U.S. <clears throat> Buildings get modified piece by piece. You you change the kitchen cabinets, but you don't change the location of the kitchen or you upgrade the plumbing fixtures in their place. And <clears throat> maybe every 20 years, you clean out the entire space and put in a, a, everything new, right? There's all ranges of, of renewal that are normal part of the way buildings transform. We, we probably need more understanding of how that works and who's doing what and the regulatory issues involved and who's paying, who's financing and stuff like that. <clears throat> but once, once it's time for whatever reason to clean out the space and put in a whole new infill, then it's a question of 
do we throw it in the trash can or do we put it into a second market, secondary market? Are, are some parts reusable <clears throat> or not? And the history so far is that re so-called reusable partitions have been an utter flop. Nobody has made any that make sense. There, I, somebody should write a book about that one. <clears throat> um, so usually gypsum board goes into one container, the metal studs go into another waste container, and they, they each get ground up and recycled into new products. You know, <clears throat> that kind of thing. So it's, uh, there, there's a whole study on the recyclability of building materials and, and their separation from the beginning. So I, I don't know, there's no one answer. I've, I've seen all kinds of ways of handling, handling that in, in different contexts. In, yeah. in that sense, uh, so Melanie, are you satisfied? Yeah, so I think uh, we should also think about that maybe uh, the infill can be, uh, yeah. Yeah. So parts actually, of the infill have different lifespans. Yeah, Melanie, you probably know that in the office market, this, the quote, systems furniture, like Steelcase and Hayworth and Herman Miller, they're really expensive systems. There's, there's, there are a lot of them sold. When, when people decide to get rid of them, they don't throw them in the dumpster. They put them into a, a very robust secondary market. So you can, you can go online and find used desks and, and partitions and lighting fixtures and stuff like that that are no longer desired in the high class market and that enter into a second market like used cars yeah great this is fine uh, steve also this is uh, what we call in dutch uh, the marktplaats, the marketplace which is an online uh, uh, thing and super used studio uh, for example uh, great architects uh, who make uh, let's say new products uh, out of our new architecture of existing uh, uh, stuff and jorn <clears throat> Beldman, he's also in the in the in the zoom here uh, says uh, that the info can be made uh, uh, generic, uh, or let's say what's the role of the architect, uh, uh, who's going, uh, will there be infill designers, uh, for instance? Eh? So who is, let's say, I think Mark Koehler is uh, also addressing this, of course, with the Costco lofts, that everybody can, his own, can be his own infill uh, designer in that way. But how do you anticipate as an industry on, on these kinds of solutions? Uh, Jorn, do you like to add something to your question? Um, so I do think you mentioned it uh, pretty well. So um, indeed, if the architect isn't going to be the infill architect, like who is going to be the infill architect? Is this an architect? Is this um, a designer? Is this um, an IKEA-ish company? Or like who is going to make the infill? Uh, new market. Yeah. I mean, I've often in the American discussions, <clears throat> I've said IKEA plus. <laughs> But you know, IKEA doesn't want to bother with pipes and wires and code-related subcontracting issues. They're they're basically furniture makers. Um, so uh, I, these are new companies, like the Chinese company. They're they're they really they smell an opportunity, <clears throat> and they get into it. They're not like IKEA. They're not like a general contractor. They're not a subcontractor. They're a new kind of company. Awesome. Yeah, and also uh, that's what uh, Peter, uh, uh, Thursday morning, Peter Stuyksdijk will give his lecture. Hey, he's also doing this. He's also an infill architect in that sense. And he's also a producer of this. But one of the main questions uh, we will ask him uh, Thursday is also the integration of uh, let's say the electricity uh, things and all the gray water and the, and the, all the, let's say the building service <clears throat> that must be implemented. 
Als in Matura is, uh, uh, dat was studied bij uh, Van Rande en uh, bij uh, uh, introduction by uh, John Habraak already. <coughs> it's now in the archive. It's still really a challenge to work on, let's say, the, the Matura 2.0. Uh, uh, maybe if uh, students will be interested in the future, I think that's really necessary. The archive is in uh, Utrecht uh, uh, now uh, already. So I think that is uh, also uh, really fine. Uh, Jorn, this is a new market also for, let's say, being an integral uh, designer, uh, I could uh, suggest, or not? Yeah, I would say so. Yeah, absolutely. Oh. I do think it's a big market as well. Yeah, yeah architects, architect, I love architects. I'm, I'm an architect. I taught architecture. We can work for all kinds of different companies. We can work for infill companies. We can work for base building companies. <laughs> we can work, you know... We, we, but they're different businesses and they have different investment uh, requirements and they have different research and development horizons. Um, like I mentioned before, the building industry goes up and down <clears throat> with the economy, but infill companies will probably have a more stable uh, economic basis because when new buildings go down, they'll still be wanted to improve the existing building stock. So it's, a, it's, just, it's just a different, just a different market. Okay. And we're, yeah. Yeah, sorry, one addition then, uh, uh, Steve. Uh, because we have to scale up in that sense. Eh? The Netherlands is not that big. I think it's, uh, uh, if you compare it, if Elon Musk is only selling Tesla in California, there's no Tesla. In Tesla yeah? Well, one, let me say one thing about, um, when I was in Holland in the 80s, I think it was, I visited Harm van Triest, who was the, uh, the energy behind Esprit. Um, they, they published a book. I think okay. I also find it here in the cupboard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, it was, it, it was like a, a compendium of infill ideas. The trouble with Esprit was, in, in my opinion, that they tried to make all the infill parts like high design, you know, fancy industrialized products like, like Herman Miller or Steelcase. The, the, so you had to buy the whole thing with all of its aesthetic, if all of its aesthetic leanings. The nice, the, so I, I thought that was pretty much doomed to failure because well so what i enjoyed learning about matura was that most of the products in a matura infill packet were right off the market they were from the big the home the big box home improvement center or the kitchen cabinet shop down the street they mostly attended to the installation problem, the routing and positioning of pipes, wires, and ducts, most of which is invisible. And that's what they put all their energy on. The rest of the product was right off the marketplace. They didn't try to invent everything. And I thought that was a, a smart strategy. What I'm, so, we, we shouldn't over-design the parts of an infill package because much of what is needed in an infill packet is already available. So we have to be very strategic. What, what particular new things are needed to unlock the Gordian knot of the installations. And whenever I would teach architecture students, they never thought about pipes and wires and ducts. They just leave, leave that to the contractor to figure out. 
well, then we're, we're, we're not, we don't know what we're doing then. So you get, get in touch with people who understand those parts of an infill package and work with them and realize that most of that is invisible. Okay, yeah, and also, I, I think that's, uh, um, uh, Caroline, uh, what do you think? Do we, uh, it's uh, uh, 10 minutes past uh, five here in the Netherlands. So we had already had a long day. I think a really inspiring lecture again. Uh, thanks for this, uh, Steve, uh, that you share. Or maybe- well, if, if, anybody, uh, if anybody wants to communicate with me, um, you know, I'm I'm a busy guy, but I'm happy to correspond with with students who have questions, and you know, so give share my email address, and uh, I'll if I don't know the answer, I I know a lot of people all over the world, and I'll just put you in touch with them. Thank you, thanks, uh, Steve. Yes. This, uh, this is the attitude. Huh? We have to change the world. This is uh, the future is still in our Zoom and also on the internet. So really appreciate it that you uh, uh, do this for us, uh, far away, uh, but uh, close by also in also the salt. Um, and uh, looking forward to meet you live in Amsterdam or in Philadelphia or whatever uh, uh, that we can share. Many thanks. Caroline, do you like to add something? Yes, I think it's a great idea when we put uh, the video uh, of Steve online on our website that we also include a list of the books he has mentioned. And I just found a thesis <clears throat> of a student in Eindhoven discussing the system that you just discussed with Tom von Trist. So maybe yeah. we can collect well, some more information for the students to read if they want to and form their own opinion, of course, uh, about uh, the contents. Yeah, and, and my website, on my own personal website, I have all the technical reports that I've written, all the articles that I've published, et cetera, et cetera. I didn't mention that uh, for the last 15 years, I've focused on healthcare architecture. And I've written a book about that with chapters from all over the world. And... Uh, um, I did consulting work for the US Department of Defense on that topic. And that's another really important field. Uh, healthcare is changing so radically. And we got to quit building buildings for healthcare that are functionally determined. Rather, we need to build healthcare facilities that are capacious enough to accommodate all kinds of changing health modalities and, and stuff. So uh, architects interested in open building get to work on that field too. Yeah. There's uh, a huge, huge market. Yeah, I can imagine also here in the Netherlands, uh, life cycle, uh, sustainable, uh, levensbestendige uh, uh, dwellings uh, we need, uh, of course. So adaptability, flexibility, uh, change of program and also change of life uh, must be integrated uh, in these uh, sorts. So again, thanks uh, Steve and thank uh, you all.